King's Tower's already prepared up waiting for any kind of royalty that might arrive or visitors generally of nobility. You have been summoned to the Lord Commander's Tower, the Lord Commander Mormont. We are only a few years after Robert's Rebellion. Everything is hunky-dory with the kingdoms right now. And Robert's going to bring a new piece to us all and make this kind of cool, awesome stuff. Uh, you hear a gruff enter. Behind the desk is sat Jor Mormon, a raven on his shoulder, pecking at some uh, corn that he's just left. You enter slightly, and then to your left, you actually notice three other brothers. They look like hardened veteran rangers. Uh, may Lord, you, you, you say to me, the Lord. Please sit. Thank you. Oh, I'll close the door. Huh? You've no doubt heard of the fate of your brother. All I know is that he didn't come back from ranging. I don't know what more than that. My rangers that went on the ranging then tell me that they... What's your name? Federica. Pleased to meet you. Is that your first time at Dragon Meat? Yes. Yes? Nice. How do you find it? It's very good, actually. You, you've been a role player for a long time? Um, on and off a few years ago, and I just recently started again with the role play heaven. With the role play heaven. So yeah. we had a, an episode of the Roy's podcast about that. Yeah, I did know. you listen to it? Yes, I did. Did you write a review on iTunes? Not yet. No, I know. The only person in the world who did that was Gary. <laughs> anyway, I'm not surprised. Anyway, <laughs> I don't know if it was clear about uh, the, the episode with role play heaven, but uh, the point of the podcast is sort of cross the channel and see what's going on on both sides of the channel. And yeah. In preparation for another episode, I'm looking into... Do you know any British game you think you would like to, to explain to French players to say, this is my favorite British game? Wow. <laughs> That's a tough question, being Italian. <laughs> so then maybe an Italian game. That's even more interesting. Wow. First off, is there a lot of role players in Italy? There is. There, there is. is a lot, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's difficult. I recorded an episode in Spain with a, with a French friend there. It's very tough to have an idea what's going on in other countries. And the other countries, yeah, it's true. So it's nice to have an Italian who is very knowledgeable and can <laughs> tell me about Italian games then. What, what's popular in Italy? Is it D&D? Is it more intrigue, uh, secret games? I'm afraid you dropped on the wrong one because my um, role-playing experience is back to uni days when okay. we were playing a lot of D&D &D actually because it was the game of the moment and everybody knew about it and it was all over the places. And then I sort of started working abroad and lost track of That's what right. was popular in Italy. And on the opposite end, do you know any f French game? No. <laughs> but I think there's one around here, the Shadow of Esteran, which is a, ah. a bit famous. I haven't played it myself. But apparently it's quite popular. Would you have anything to say to encourage people to come to Roleplay Heaven? It's a great ambience, we have a lot of fun, it's a lot, good way to meet people and play different games and get back in track as I'm doing with the um, role-playing words. Okay. And it's good, yeah, it's really good. Great, thank you, have, a, have a lovely day. <laughs> you too. Okay, it's still at Dragon Meet and like anywhere else in London, you keep running into expats. They speak French, they speak Spanish, or they speak Italian. Indeed, I'm another Italian, yes. And you're also at RP Evan. Yeah, yes, I found out about it because uh, I had stopped, uh, just as Federica, I stopped playing after uni. When I got here, I didn't play much. And then uh, I started playing with Italian friends, some in London and some in Italy, using Skype. Uh -huh, and okay. now we still play together using Roll20. Oh, yeah, 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 I got yes. some, some people yes. at the Guild, the Rollies Francophone, the law, yeah. are trying that too. Yeah, I mean, I would really recommend to any French people here who miss their friends in France to play together. And anyway, uh, I got back into the hobby, <laughs> habit of it both. <laughs> so I looked on the web and I found out that uh, Roleplay Heaven was near my house. So, so. You, you heard my question to your, your colleague yeah, here. I did, yeah. Uh, what are the, the big Italian role-playing games? Right, uh, well, I would say, I mean, I don't know the scene there as much because uh, I've been living here 21 years. But from what I can see when I go there and what is sold, people uh, are quite into 
still the traditional games like D&D and Call of Cthulhu, lots of them are translated, uh -huh, yeah. as, as in French as well, yeah, I guess. Of course. And also Savage Words, the sister, Savage Words. Uh, Savage Words. Uh, so, yeah. Yes, uh, so, uh, and uh, I mean, there are even some Italian writers for campaigns for it. Uh, so, uh, and then younger people than me, like a younger generation of players, they are into Numenera and these kind of games. Maybe what I don't see played as much in Italy, but I might be wrong, yeah, is yeah. Uh, indie games. Here, yeah, really? I have not yet heard of, but, you know, I may just not know the right people. You know, the like, same for me, I'm yes, not yes, well so, informed. Uh, yeah, but like here it's quite big, Fate, uh, Microscope, um, Stars Without Numbers, uh, all these uh, like indie scene. And uh, there is actually a group in that other room that are playing that stuff. In Italy, I don't know if that's still very much. Um, and you don't know either any recent or old games created in Italy, then? I know of, yeah, there are board games created in Italy, uh, for sure. For role playing, I actually own uh, some um, campaigns and scenarios, I even Beasts, Beasts and Barbarians. The author is Italian, uh -huh, and it's, okay. a, like, it's, a, it's a whole word, like a bit Conanish con word for Savage Words. And there is a, another um, word uh, that is uh, like uh, Renaissance Italy, and uh, I don't remember the name right now, <laughs> but it's like... Uh, and uh, you know, that uh, when I run, um, speaking of French games, when I ran uh, Cthulhu, I ran uh, Masks uh, of Nyarlathotep uh, yeah. two years ago, And so I wanted my players to stop in Paris. And so I did some research and I found uh, there are lots of uh, really nice adventures published by players who wrote them on the web. So uh -huh. I found one in French and it was really good. And uh, it had uh, really interesting things from the 20s, like the Girl Cassé, uh, the Apache, the Dance Apache, and all these things. So, so <laughs> that sounds great. Yeah, so I introduced that in my adventure. So But uh, do you know any French game that you have um, played? I would not know, unless it's printed in French, I would yeah, not know yeah. if it's French. You so know, you never so heard of, I'm going to name a few I know, uh, Bloodlust? No, no, where no, you play you play character linked to a, a zombie weapon. Zombicide, that's French, isn't it? I don't know. I don't <laughs> know. A, I think, uh, but I think that's Zombicide is French. It's a board it's a very, game. It's a board game, yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah, I played that and I know that the guy who writes it is French. Ne never heard of Nephilim? Yeah, but I have not played it. That, afraid, that's yeah, that's so. French. Illumine Satanis is a mm. successful okay. one yeah, where yeah, you yeah. play angels and demons oh, in okay. a contemporary world. Like, so it's similar to Nephilim. Yeah, no, with the exception that it's very, it's rather humoristic. It's, it's kind of okay, like, yeah, have yeah. you ever read Good Omens? Yes. It's exactly like uh, Good okay, Omens yeah, by yeah. The Terry Pratchett and New Game. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, speaking of Italian players, I know that some of the younger ones uh, that mentioned, uh, actually, uh, that belies my age, but they are the son and daughter of uh, my friends, <laughs> so they, and all their friends. I think they play a game with angels and demons and stuff. Maybe like that. So Maybe one. that one Maybe. of those, yeah. No, no. Okay, great. Jana, thank yes. you very much. You're Have a lovely day and you uh, too. see you around. Good occasion to mention that we're going to have the drinks and dices. Yes, I saw that on Facebook. So I yeah, it's on, in February, late February, yeah. and it, it, hopefully it will be a monthly event between yeah. the Rollies podcast, Roleplay Heaven, of course. Because you're not far from us. Well, we are... We don't really have a place, we okay, are around yeah, the yeah, place. Yeah. But we thought that it would be nice to have something yeah. central London where yeah. we could meet every month. Sounds very good. So, yeah. And open to anyone in London, actually. Okay, okay so I fantastic. hope you, you'll join yeah, us. Thanks. Have a lovely day, thank you very much. <laughs> Or I didn't myself see any signs. Did the rangers try to track him? Ask him yourself. And he kind of motions over to the three rangers, the defeated soul swords, that are present in the meeting. He disappeared, that's all we know. With your upbringing and your skill with a bow, he might be able to survive in the wild for a, uh, a few days. But the cold will get him, so. Um, If the wildlings don't. They won't take him in, unless they want a pet. I don't think he would be so so foolish and desperate just, just to try that. And he would know that he would have, he would be facing a hard death. Well, he did ask a lot of questions about the wildlings, though. I tried to set his mind to other things, but now he's gone. 
Well, is it possible he was captured by Wild Wings? Not things? according to Selwyn. Well, when he slashed his tent, he'd taken things with him, food, provisions, so it was unlikely he left him in a rush, you know, it seemed planned almost. Hmm. Did he express any unhappiness being here? You know, every brother grumbles about the wall. I mean, I'd be lying if I said I'd met any brother who um, never expressed any unhappiness about being here. True. You hear? <laughs> Brian, I'm giving you this responsibility, and you alone. I want you to find your brother. Any other brother that goes with you is going to their own volunteer, their own responsibility. Let's face it, if we send him out his own, it's good in the end of the phone, he's dead. If you would send one brother out beyond the wall to look for his brother, then I would join him. For I'm also the brother of a lost man. I've been mentoring the lad. I cannot just let him go like this. Well, I suppose on that note, being the last to see him, I also want to go with you. Thomas what? I'm a builder. Yes, I spoke to your brother. Yes, I knew him. I don't want yeah. you to die. I don't care about you. Surely the more of us that go, the less likely he is to die. I'm a builder. Well, think of it this way. Now you get to be a builder going north of the moon more than any other builder. Man up and grow up here. That's because his brother goes off and deserts. Doesn't we make me know suicidal. Deserted. We know he deserted. His brother is your brother. You swore an oath, just like he did. He abandoned his oath. That we are cannot he, tell he, for sure yet. I can't tell for sure he talked to me. Oh, did he? What's this? He had doubts. He wanted to go free. Let him. Free? You mean with the... the there's no the free from free the folk? The proof? No, there's no proof. It's not going free, it's basically suicide. But then your host wants you to punish that deserter. Punish that? I don't care. I mean, if I knew I could survive, I would have gone with him. You put every one of us at risk of death because you chose to ignore the fact he wanted to desert. If he'd deserted while he was on watch, we would have been asleep and anything would have killed us. So you have just admitted to us that you risk our lives. You, I am not responsible for his You are desertion. responsible for every brother. You are responsible for defending the realms of men and you decided to ignore that fact defending when you let us Defending the control. realms of men. We, you, we are the criminals, the rapists that have been thrown in here and do nothing but freeze and eat crap all Oi, day long. that's enough. Ryan. I'd rather be dead. I was wrong. This isn't your sole responsibility. Get out, all of you. As you're escorted out of the Lord Commander's tower, the night is blowing a gale outside. It's cutting. We're going out in this weather. Never gonna get any better sooner. Winter is coming. <laughs> Dragon Meat sent out an invite for people to interview, and, and a nice person says yes. <laughs> so, who are you? My name's Porter Williams. I, I'm an American living in London. Great. The podcast is about expats, so it, it's yeah. perfect. French. I just had a couple of Italians. Is it your first time in Dragon Meat? Yes, I saw it last year and I wanted to come, but uh, I was traveling and didn't allow, so I was really excited to come this year. Great. Are you playing here in London? You got a regular table? Or? Not a regular table, but I do have an occasional game with another couple me and my wife play with. We'll play usually Fate or some board games. We get together every so often, but we have a number of friends that will also, in addition to that role-playing game, we'll just get together and play some board games. We have a big collection. When we moved here, we shipped one box jammed full of every board game we could fit in that one box. That's and we just like bought a few more today, so we can no longer fit one box, I think. Next time, it'll be two boxes. Or you're stuck in London. Or we're stuck in London. All your board games. <laughs> That's perfect. So have you, have you heard about uh, RP Event, for instance, which is uh, uh, the biggest club uh, for players in London? Yeah. They, they contribute to the organization here. Uh, the question I ask to people is telling me about games from their country but I guess American games maybe other well, it ha it's been really interesting because so coming from from where I lived in the US in Utah to London it's been very different 
kind of role playing community environment. So I in in Utah, I had fr- long time friends that I would connect with kind of through high school, through university, that we'd been playing together for 10 or 20 years. And then moving here, we had to kind of start from scratch. And I, I did actually start connecting with with a friend through through a, a Google Plus group. And then from there, he connected me to the Indie Meet. Um, yeah, yeah. The Indie Meet RPG nice. group, which has been fantastic. We've made some, not some, not, not like regular friends, but just made some nice connections there. And But the whole... The norm here seems to be getting together and playing at the pub, which is completely different from what I'm used to in the U.S. It's always meet at the the gaming store or or at someone's house once you're comfortable with the new set of people. But if you've got a group of people that you have no idea who they are and it's just sort of a get-together pickup group, usually you'd play at your local friendly local game store. In a very comfortable Yeah, because they have a room because yeah. space is cheap out west. You have game stores with massive, you know, they have six game tables open on a Sunday or something like that. And that just doesn't exist here. There's no space. And so finding room for a game table in London is really hard. Yeah, and uh, we discussed that uh, already in the podcast. Mm-hmm. But it's indeed, it's, I think it's very specific to London. I'm not even sure it applies to other UK mm-hmm. cities. In Belgium, we would play at each other's house. Yep. Here, it's difficult because people live far apart because London is yeah. quite spread London out. London is huge, and no one, no one you play with actually lives in London. They, everyone lives outside of London, and so unless you're in the same area, like we're looking for people in Southwest, you know, and then uh, everyone we connect with, they're like, oh, I'm in the East, I'm in the North, and it's just too far away. It's hard to get together with people. And it's, it's difficult even for organizations like Roleplay even to find yeah. a place centrally located that's sure. why they got the Stratford Lewisham place and now they got the North London place mm-hmm. and in the case of uh, the group that I'm part of which is just French speakers mm-hmm. other people are welcome but French speakers we, we don't even have a place as we said mm-hmm. we play at the on the lobby of the Royal Festival halls mm-hmm. in pubs etc yeah, that's so that's about where we play and how we play but uh, we, did you notice any difference in the way we play the things which are played by Britons compared to Americans? Are the game which are popular different or the, the approach to them? Um, I would say this has more to do with the particular community that I've ended up kind of interacting with, which is the Indie Meet London group, which is that uh, very much the, the the core of where I was interacting in back in the States was around Dungeons & Dragons, Pathfinder, kind of your, your core traditional games. And the circle I've kind of found myself in with a group of people I really like um, is very much kind of running counter to that. You know, um, so I end up playing a lot more of kind of a, a, like, like Cthulhu or Fate or some of the other, you know small te- play test games, mm-hmm. things like that. And it's just a different focus, but I think that's more about the community than what specific games are popular here. When I look on meetup.com, a lot of the meetup groups are... Uh, D and D or Pathfinder based, or you know Warhammer, or those kind of tabletop yeah. battle games, things like that. Have you ever played or heard about any game which would have happened to be created in France? In France, no, no, never heard about In Nomine Satanis, for instance, Magna Veritas. You know what? Actually, now that you mention those, I have heard of those. I didn't realize they were French. Yeah, yeah, but I've heard of them. That, that's what I realized now that I'm asking the question to people: yeah. is that people well, obviously don't really care so much about Mm. where games come from. Well, it's interesting you bring that up, though, because since moving from the States to here, I have become acutely aware of how Americentric the gaming world tends to be in terms of assumptions of English Mm -hmm. as a first language, in terms of uh, assumptions about just kind of uh, the, 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 you know, what the, what normal is yeah. and and I, I've just or even like shipping on Kickstarters like suddenly Kickstarters I have to really check wait does it ship to the UK is it absurdly expensive for it to ship to the UK or sometimes you're pleasant you're really pleased and they ship right in they're based in the UK and you're really happy mm. you know but uh, I've become a lot more aware of that since moving here gaming communities for role playing games seems to be very nationally centric what I, why I, what I'm slowly finding out about is how we have no idea what Spaniards are playing. We have no idea what Italians are oh, playing. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's really weird. And there are, I believe there are very interesting things, but there's really little translation and knowledge of what we are each doing. And 
you were mentioning Kickstarter. There's equivalents in well, in France at least, and I assume in Spain and Italy as well. There's a bit of a risk of being fragmented, I find, because these independent things, even less than other, maybe don't have an editor to push for a translation export. Yeah. And actually, localization is difficult and it's expensive. Yeah. And so unless you have someone who is, ta you know, just because someone's multilingual doesn't mean they can carry out a quality translation publishing effort. That's a that's a different that requires a skill set that not a lot of people have. And that, that's really hard. But and proofreading, etc. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, well, thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's lovely to meet you. Well, lovely to meet you. Do check the podcast. Let's keep Absolutely. in touch in, on Twitter. And uh, send questions or any, any ideas, and that would be cool. Enjoy the rest of the show. Okay, you too. Nice meeting you. Bye. As the gates come up slowly into one of the passages, you're... We'll head into the ice surrounding this kind of natural foot. Uh, the, 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 the gate comes back down, and you're held there briefly for just a little bit longer than you really feel comfortable. And then the next gate starts opening. The light from the underneath the wood almost, almost blinding as beyond you stretches sentinel upon sentinel tree of the, the haunted forest. Rangers, when you last went out, you were tracking the movements of what they call themselves the ghost clan, and they tend to almost literally haunt the Holy Forest. If we go to where he lost it, yeah. so, the odds of any tracks being around are unlikely, but he might have returned after he'd gone to try and get his last bit of blood. If someone then can roll me a survival orientation, so I guess, yeah, so if Sori's leading, then. What we can do is we can we can no that's cool that's cool we'll take that result because what we can do with it is we can give it to uh, an assist. Ninety. Nice. All right. The ground itself is pretty freshly fallen in snow, but it is fairly sunny and well for north of the wall at least kind of as pleasant as it can be. Uh, it's not blowing a gale now. It's snowed a bit overnight so. Whilst that would work to a disadvantage, you can use the trees and your knowledge of the haunted forest to make your way back to the little crook in the river where you nestled up to camp that night. There are still, under the tree cover, amongst the frozen dirt that you, that you uh, were, you can still see a little bit of scorch marking from the fire that you built. You can still even see some of the kind of pitching marks from the tent and stuff because the, the ground is is so frozen so we are at the we are at the camp where you or the camp site at least where you pitched up and where he went missing uh, what do you guys exactly want to do where do you see the uh, figure darted well I was two people going through the camp where I was on watch and I remember that night we were hearing some scuffle and the woods not really aware what it was but then not long after that I realised that uh, realised that he was gone he had taken the food of the fire and he had taken some of the provisions from his tent with him what more is there to say when we watched he, he looked like he'd been spooked by something and he ran off I know he took the stuff with him, but... No, no, no. Um, you know, you're not a green boy. You're not your brother's person. But the fact is, he wanted out. We've still got to find him. Well, That's what the bear yeah. said. We've got we have to find him. Okay, who's the best to find some of his tracks? You will watch for his tracks. All of us brothers, we watch. And uh, we land in here to notice anything potentially dangerous. I don't think you're an expat. You don't live in London, right? No, no, no. I don't live here. So I, I'm living in Paris. Sorry, first, you're, you're an alien. Yeah. From Forge Sombre. Yes, this is a, a collective of artists mm -hmm. who make this game. So and this game is Shadows of Esther. Yes. I was just discussing with some uh, fellow player from Utah in the US. Oh, it was difficult to have an idea of what was going on in different countries and a little, a little number of games were actually translated 
well, to English, which I guess is a lingua franca. Why Shadow of Esteran happened to be translated in English? In fact, we made it ourselves. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we made the translation ourselves. Okay. Okay, but I reassure you, I am not the translator <laughs> because my English is, you know. But the thing is that we make it because for us it was a dream to make it. And by chance, it was the time when Kickstarter arise. So back in three, four years ago now, I have a German friend. His name is Ingo. And Ingo, he told me, you should check Kickstarter. Yeah, yeah. And I, I told him what it is. Well, it looks cool. So let's try it. And uh, it was a success. So this way, we were able to print the books and send them there. But it, it gave us, you know, the will to go on in translating other books. So the game initially was on Kickstarter, but in French? In French, it was published in the traditional way. Okay. No crowdfunding, nothing. Now we are using crowdfunding. Oh, I see. Uh, because we are totally independent, you know. We are publishing ourselves. This is why it, it's a special way. Because now there is more and more French games that are translated by Cubicle 7, uh -huh, okay. uh, the game of the seven circles. Okay, uh, maybe yeah. you know it. There is uh, the Nordic game Yggdrasil. Oh, I didn't know it was French. Uh, yeah, it, it's French. Okay. Okay, a uh, Chin, the Chinese. King, yeah, yeah, uh, Q I N. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure. I, I'm not sure either. <laughs> but the thing is that English based publisher are now much more. It becomes easy, you know, because there are some connections now. Yeah, so see. there are more and more games from France translated in English, but also in Spanish. But Shadows of SN is a special because of what I told, is that we are doing it ourselves. So for the people who don't know Shadows of Esteran, what is it about? Basically, it's Call of Cthulhu meet Dungeon and Dragons. Very Celtic. Our main inspiration is the Celtic culture myths. The idea was to build, because I love medieval settings, where you can play in a medieval world, but in the Call of Tulu way. Okay. You are, you are playing human, you need to be careful, you are trying to survive in cold forest, you know what I mean? So yeah, it's, it's not epic in the no, sense yeah, of yeah, you're yeah. you not shining. And, uh... yeah, this is more low and dark fantasy, and I love that. I, I am a fan of the Wav Wavenloft setting, you yeah, know, yeah. Castle Wavenloft. In our work, you can find all the gothics and all themes, teams, themes. Yes, teams, top Team, subjects. Yeah, teams. and uh, these teams are in the low fantasy way. Not very much strange creatures. Maybe some exist, mm -hmm. but there are not vampires everywhere. But there are some legions of it. Okay. You know what I mean? So it's really like in the Call of Tulu mood. I love this, all of this game, you know. So maybe there is something in the dark, but you but need you're to. Not sure. you're, you're not sure. You, you don't have an encounter yeah. table when you cross yeah. the forest. So this is why in the game system, this is really l uh, short in the fighting system. It's only three pages. Mm -hmm. But you have a, a bigger chapter about sanity. So okay. how your character is evolving. That's it. You know, we are role players. At first, we are, are role players. Shadows of Extreme meet success. It was unexpected. So now we are trying to go on and we are happy to share it with everyone. But it's true that it's a special game, you know, special in maybe you will not like it mm -hmm. because uh, it's very, very focused. But if you like it, maybe you will like it a lot. So, so you know what I mean? So you it's not about pleasing everyone at once, it's about really pleasing a lot a uh, group of people with yeah I, I, yes <laughs> yes because you know you you need to be in the mood for this but if you can if you like it maybe it's really for you you can download the first book the book zero for free i, I put the the link on the yeah. description so you the... can you can just check 
I tell that to the, the gamers, just check the... You, you need to know if it's for you or not before buying all the books, you know. <laughs> I guess it's a bit of a large question, but do you think there's something as a French touch? Do people acknowledge the fact that the creator of Shadows of Esteran are French? Do, do they say something about that or do they just ignore that? It's just a product on its own and uh, they, they treat it as such? More than a French touch, maybe a European touch. Okay. Because I tell that because in the US, they feel that we are working the medieval teams mm -hmm. in a special way, in a very old European way. It's not that it's more historical. For example, one of our main inspiration is... Uh, uh, Tw uh, not a, tribe, a tribe, uh, a culture. Yeah, yeah, you know, but I, I was uh, thinking about traditional art. Crafts. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, we are really building into the roots of European culture. Maybe it's more... Your question is difficult because yeah, I, I, I don't know how they feel about that, but I heard that a lot. It's really special, they said. Because there is some exotism, exotism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, exotic. Uh, For them, it, it's exotic. Yeah, <laughs> because you know, we are coming from the old continent, so I don't know. It's it's strange, but the thing is that we have a, a different background, a, a, a different historical background, and uh, maybe we are much more interested in other thematics. Uh, at first, we, when uh, we worked on uh, Shadows of Esther, and people said, why are you doing another medieval game? The first reason is that I love that. <laughs> so, you know, I love that. Yeah. I am a Dungeon and Dragon fan at first. So, but, of course, the point is not to do the same game again. Yeah, that, that's what they call the, uh, your USP, your unique selling point. Or you differentiate what you do from what's yeah, already there. Yeah, yeah, and maybe this is it. To work on the medieval, fant uh, uh, how would you say that? Uh, medieval fantastic, uh, it's, um, yeah, of, uh, ah, sorry, I lost my words, but you know, it's, uh, how would you say medieval fantastic? The Man medieval fantasy. Met you know fan. the, the Met fan, you know Met, the classic Met fan. Classic Met fan, a uh, sort of Monty Hall and very. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, with the elves, dwarves, and yeah. everything. Very so, Tolkien. Yes, yeah, very, to, yeah, this, this is true. And so, D &D, of course. Yeah, of course it is. So this is very important on the feel of your game. Mm -hmm. The thing is, we just decided to put this aside and to focus on something else. Characters, Sanity, investigation, survival. This is very common for some Call of Tulu games. Yes. But it, it's not so common for medieval fantasy games. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, me, me, Vampire, the Dark Ages, pop to mind. Of course. For, for me, it's a reference. Mm. I have to say that Game of Thrones help us a lot. Because now people really they quickly understand what we are doing. It's dark fantasy. It's cool. Yeah. The world is beautiful. The world is is really fascinating. But it's very dangerous. And you are a human being. And you can die very quickly. When you tell that to a Call of Tulu fan, he knows what you mean. But now, thanks to Game of Thrones, yeah. we know what it means in a medieval setting. So, you yeah, it's, you got a clear picture. To yeah, yeah, yeah. It. And uh, this is it. Yeah. At some point, you are just playing human being and you are trying to survive. You are trying to understand how your character will evolve in this world. It's really focused on the character. Sounds great. I will definitely check it out uh, online. Last question to sort yeah. of wrap up. Besides Shadows of Esther and of course, what would be the French game you would recommend Britons and Americans to, to give a try to? Is there something you think it's very typically French or very of special interest for you and which happen to be French? I am uh, digging in my brain because there are some games now that are translated. Uh, oh, don't worry about the translation. No, the, just the, in gen just general. Just a game, a game yeah. you like, 
maybe you, you can take a look at Malefis. Uh huh. Yeah. Malefis is really a, a game very special. So what is it about? It's difficult for me to explain, but you need to check that. You, okay. you, need, you need to discover that because it, it can take some time to explain this to you. But I let discover that. Uh, maybe there is some English PYC translation or something okay. because it's a very good game and very well written. And uh, in the same way, it's, there is Todium for Massacre. Yeah. Okay, so it's... Uh, This, these games are very uh, strong in their background and they are very documented, you know, st historical. Just to explain to people listening who might not know Tedium for a Massacre, it's a game set, uh, if I'm correct, I haven't played it, The Massacre of the Huguenots. So it's a real historic event of yeah, French yeah. history, which, by the way, led a lot of Huguenots to move to London yeah, and that's yeah. why we've been so many French speakers over here for, for and Malefice is really about gothics and uh, dark ambience it, it's a really good game you know it's strong strong and deep game I hope there is some kind of translation or downloading some, but you may check that carefully I, who knows maybe we'll create the interest and someone will translate yeah it. yeah of course of course Hopefully. maybe maybe yeah but uh, these two yeah these two games yeah, okay, thank you so much for your thank time thank you thank you for visiting us and, and I hope you Shadows of Estran will continue to be such a, a success and a pioneer of uh, yeah, French yeah. role playing in yeah, we, are, we are happy and to be here today okay. thank you thanks the key advantage you have is that the direction which he fled which is northwest crosses the river and this is shallow enough just about uh, to cross there really are a couple of options there might be more one of the options is that it's flowing actually at the moment yeah it's warm enough for it to flow at the very edges it's freezing up where it's not moving so quickly but the actual flow of the river itself does enable it to, to remain when he ran did he take his garret his Oh, yeah. I don't think we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we'll just put prices. So that would suggest that no, just yeah. him on foot. Yeah, you returned his yeah. horse to them. Is there any break in the ice around the. Obviously, it's, it's not fully fitness, but <laughs> as it goes in, it's going to break the ice, it will reform. Broken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tracks yeah. of anyone Probably. crossing the river. Make me a survival track. Yeah, um, 22. So, so Popeye, are you talking us through that break in the ice? You actually just stood pointing at this bit in the ice, going, yeah, it's... This is where someone's crossed. This is breaking the ice. Uh, inside of the surroundings. You're nestled quite nicely here in Bend in the River. On the other side of the bank, on the northern side, you have another bank at about the same level, but you also have uh, like a slight but sharp incline that comes up to a little hill kind of thing and then what you think based on the horizon pitches down probably lower than the elevation you are at now it's nature for a running man to go uphill so if we cross where he crossed follow up we're not, we're not going to see ground sign very easily after, after, after two weeks but the, the child doesn't know, doesn't know the wives so if we go up there we can make an educated guess where he's gone next what, what was so Uh, crossing? Yeah. 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 Crossing. yeah. Cool, okay. Just on foot. Go to your death. You come oh, with us. With us. <laughs> okay, you cross the river on horseback. I need, please, an animal handling ride check from everybody. I don't have animal handling at all. So you're rolling two dice. Two dice is like a base skill for everyone. Every, every player has two dice and stuff. If this is 2B, is that you? Sorry. 11 for me, which is 10. 16. Okay. Oh. For it is difficult. You can tell that he's having problems trying to keep a horse, but as he gets to the other side of the bank, just manages to. You look back, however, and Ryan is shoulder deep, squatted down in the river. 
Okay. You're not drowning or anything, don't worry. But you are absolutely freezing. And it's that kind of cold that catches your breath and stops you breathing for... I've, I've, I've handed my range to Gregor and I'm going back for him. Okay, against the strength of the river, against picking up as well. If you can roll me an athletics strength check. Uh, 11. Perfect, cool. You drag him to his feet, carrying him like... His mama used to, probably. This, you, you're, you're carrying him, trudging across the river, gets the other side of the bank, and he is, at, uh, yeah, Ryan is absolutely shivering in your hands. His breath faint, but very sh- quite shallow as well as he tries to almost hyperventilate his way back to heat. So. Uh, snow on the ground? I won't be any yeah. cold if you put me on the snowy ground. On, the, on this side of the bank no, there is. Very well. I'm rolling it. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, what you should do... It's what we teach for to survive. If you fall in the water, you get out and you roll in the snow. Yeah. And the snow oh. draw, draws the moisture off the top. Yeah, wow. Insane. So, really? roll him in snow and then, like... <laughs> that's odd. Lay down with him and pack the snow over us. Dude. Oh, that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> do we have a chain <laughs> here? Right yeah. Let's come some food on what they are here for. All right. I'm not even going to ask you to roll. That was that was really quite cool. Uh, yeah. Um, touch it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, boy. You'll warm up soon. Oh, please stop. Cool. <laughs> as you as you come out of the little snow huddle, it, it does stop you guys for a little while. Uh, the sky is beginning to pink. Still a dragon meat. <laughs> I'm doing that for the second time because I failed the recording. Still a dragon meat. Running into the competition, I'm here with two gentlemen from the former gamer uh, Dungeons and Dragons podcast. What? What is your podcast about? Well, we're an actual play D and D podcast. So yep. it's just listening to four good friends being very bad at playing Dungeon Dragons, but having a lot of fun doing it. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, I'm uh, my name's Jules. I'm one of the characters on it. We we swap the GMing role. Yeah. Um, oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, so we're on the four seasons now, so I'm Danny, and I've, I've DM'd one season. Yep. You dm you're halfway through DMing your halfway first through, season. Halfway through, yeah. And uh, Abu, who's our third member, of permanent member, has DM'd two seasons. He's exactly. been a bit greedy with it. Uh, and yeah, we're just taking turns. We try and have a sort of light on rules, heavy yeah. on sort of role play and story sort of sessions. Sort of, a lot of, a lot of character work, a lot of annoying character voices. Yep, <laughs> yeah. That's, that's our speciality. Yeah, I know. Very annoying accents. That's, that's probably our best work. So yeah. you're 108 episodes in? 108 yeah. episodes in, That's yeah. impressive. If someone wants to get stuck into a podcast, that's a lot of episodes. <laughs> yeah, we split yeah. up into seasons. That yeah. You can jump in at any season. Uh, there's some shorter than others, but I think season three is about 20 episodes, so mm. 20 hours of content on that one. That's probably our shortest, <laughs> shortest one. So all, all of our seasons um, follow different characters and different stories, but they're all set in the same kind of uh, land continent. Mm-hmm. So we keep the kind of the politics, the geography, the you know the general like kind of political stuff going. Uh, and we're quite proud of our world building as yeah, well. Yeah, it's something we put quite yeah, a lot of effort into. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's a homemade, a custom D and D setting. Yeah, it's yes. our own setting. D and D five. Four was what you four. Did, we, we play update. it like five though, because yeah. we're not very good at sticking to the rules. No, it's uh, the DM has complete autonomy to just change what he wants at will, yeah. and so we we will be changing for season five to fifth edition just to speed the combat mm. up a little bit. But we learnt on four how to mm. sort of when we started doing the podcast, we were on four, and then five came out, and we we don't want to change halfway through a season, but I think we will we will have to make that leap because it is unfortunately a, a much more efficient system for a podcast. <laughs> Were you inspired by things like uh, Acquisition Incorporated or One Shot uh, RPG? It was um, the first one was um, Nerd Poker. Yeah, and that's the one. That, oh. that's Brian Persane's game, especially the season where it was DM'd by Sark. Who I thought his GMing style really the beginning ones. Yeah, and it really opened our eyes because we weren't into D and D before that, but it really opened our eyes about how exciting it'd be to have these characters and just do whatever you yeah. want. You come we, from a very video game background where you you know you can only do what the video game wants you to do. Why am I not surprised you're playing to D and D four? Well, that's, that's all. That's yeah. what was available at the time. That's yeah. what they were playing on the shows. We're like, we'll try and do what they're doing. Yeah. I'm running a D four game too. So it's, uh, it, I, I, I do, there are bits of it that I absolutely love. It just is 
when recording it takes an awful long time. I spend a lot of time editing out, yeah, go, us flicking yeah. through and going, hang on a minute, which, which, uh, how many times do I have that? Have I used that skill today? Have I rested since then? <laughs> it's not the most complicated. It's much simpler than 3.5, personally, well, yeah. I find. Yeah. It just can take a while and it can bog down the episodes. Our epi- I think our best work is when it's quite a lot of character work and yeah. like just crazy scenarios happening out of the random play, you know. Yeah. Um, which yeah, which can happens quite often. Really. Okay, enough about your podcast. Yeah. Let's go back to the Rollies podcast, which is about crossing the channel, etc. Would there be a Brit your Britons? Right? Yeah, yeah. Yep. By British, Britain. yeah. What would be the British game? British bread game you would recommend to try or you find very typical and you would recommend abroad I think shooting an apple off someone's <laughs> head that <was> Swiss <laughs> <laughs> the British <laughs> British based game I don't know tabletop RPG tabletop I know he's just being ridiculous um, I don't know a British based game I think GURPS is British Right. GURPS is well. GURPS is a good system. I think I often don't look at where the games are from. No, we just played Apocalypse I wouldn't even know what was the same time, first time, and that was yeah. excellent. Loved Apocalypse World, but I couldn't tell you. I yeah. assume it's American, but only because I wouldn't know what. I was assume British, most things yeah. are American, yeah. like, but <laughs> it's just me being fat and racist, I guess. Yeah. Anything with Judge Dredd in it? <laughs> yeah. Judge ah, Dredd yeah. is UK. Yeah, uh, that's Judge pretty brilliant. The miniature game. Yeah, is, looks awesome. I'd recommend that one. Yeah. Is Paranoia uh, British? No, I, I don't know. No idea. Yeah, this is the problem. Yeah. Like now everything's online. I just a nation seems to mean less to me than it ever has before. Mm. Well, maybe you got a British touch or an American touch. Some subjects which yeah. are different. Mm. What's the best Swiss tabletop gaming? I don't know. I'm not Swiss. <laughs> oh, well, Belgium. Belgium. <laughs> Belgium. Sorry. You were saying Swiss yeah, to me. You said William Tell. Oh, oh no. Someone's head. What? Well, I can speak about French yeah. role-playing game. I guess one of my favorites is Nephilim. Uh, knuckle role-playing game. It's it's been translated ages ago. It's like, I guess it's a bit like it's a less dark world of darkness in a way. Right. Lots of groups, Templars, mists. Then you play a being which lives through history, and then there's a lot of intrigue, uh, investigation, etc., and uh, groups against each other. Because even on your side, there, there's a different group for each blade of the. Tarot, that's what we call oh, it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is there anything that makes it particularly French? And it much kissing in it or anything like that? <laughs> <laughs> or, or cousins? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't gonna go there. I wasn't gonna go there. So do you know any French game yourself? I don't no? think I don't no. know. No, that's thing, I, I literally don't know any in like where any of them are from. I think know, the, one which, the maybe one which was successful abroad was in Nominee Satanis. I'm not even heard, no. I don't know I've heard of I it. I think you'd love this one. Yeah. Indomine Satan is it's set in a contemporary world, meaning in the 90s because it was yeah. before 2000, so it was all about <laughs> the apocalypse coming. But you play demons, working oh, nice. for Prince Demons, but it's very humoristic. Have you ever read Neil Gaiman's and Terry Pratchett Good Omens? Yeah. Mm. It's exactly like that. Great book. Yeah, yeah. Even more over the top. So you yeah. <laughs> you play for us for this. For, you got a different print and a bit like in Vampire the Mascara, you got a different set of powers. Right. So if you're under the, the demon prince Asmodeus, the prince of games, mm. you've got a power, for instance, which is stupid dare game. So you can say to someone, hey, you wouldn't dare doing that. Right. And they will do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if they do it, you'll never be able to subjugate them again. But if they don't, you, you can again use your point <laughs> to say, hey, do that very stupid thing, but whatever you want. So that's, yeah, that's the sort of thing demons would do. <laughs> I, I like that. Yeah, I like so. the manipulation of that. So In Nomine awesome. Satan is Magna Veritas. Nomine Veritas. Satan. Oh, we'll, yeah. we'll have to find that one out. Check it out. And maybe run a few episodes. We'll have to, yeah, well, we should run a different system. That would yeah, be a nice yeah, yeah. little bonus content we could do, definitely. I suppose the detail on the description of the <laughs> Well, we'll check it out when we listen. Thanks again, both. Please, listeners, do check the, the Formal Gamer, yep. a Dungeons & Dragons podcast. An episode every week, then? Every Saturday. Yeah. Every Saturday. Like clockwork. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I will check it out. Sometimes a bit late if I'm hungover. <laughs> yeah. but that, that's the only thing that slows us down. Great. Enjoy your dragon meat. You too. Have a good day. And uh, one last thing. We are setting up with RP Evan, that French-speaking, the La Guilde des Rollis Francophones de Londres, and the Rollis Podcast, a monthly drink in central London. I'm from Sheffield, so that's going to be a oh, bit of okay. a drive for me every week. I'm not, so I can go. <laughs> yeah, if you want to join, we call that the drinks and dices, so the D&D. Very good. 
Yeah. I could I could probably venture down once yeah. in a while. So well, I'll send you the south, south, and that would be lovely. Okay, great. Well, nice one. Thank you very much. Bye. Enjoy. Still at Dragon Meat, and uh, Dragon Meat is not only role-playing games. There's also a lot of board games. And one little thing which is quite cool is that you've got game designers, board game creators coming here to playtest their game. And among them, I've just played a game here created by Oliver Brooks here. Hi. King's Watch. Can you say already anything about it? Uh, yeah, I can say a little bit about it. It's a cooperative game where two to four players take on the role of the King's Men, trying to ensure peace, order, and justice, and keep everything running over in the city make sure that crime doesn't get out of control because they've got a good reputation of having the best city in the world so they don't really want to let on that their city might have a dark and seedy underbelly so your job as the players is to find these criminals and bring them to justice and make sure that uh, the city keeps its perfect image is it your first game this is the first game that i will probably have out myself however it's not the first game i've ever designed as anyone who's a designer will tell you uh, they probably have five or six <laughs> half unfinished prototypes or things that they've worked on so no this wasn't my first game to design but it certainly was the first game that I've had serious pick up for how do you make the jump from uh, I guess you were playing a lot of board games Why? yeah why so it's not just board games but it's, it's immersing yourself in the gaming community so it's not just board games but role playing games card games however you get into this hobby It's taking that and then finding yourself with an idea and just working on it and making sure that once you've got the idea, you know where you're going with it. And once you've got a working prototype of your idea, stick it in front of as many people as possible and get their feedback because there's no point having it in your head and whatever you thought was right is probably wrong in the long term because at the end of the day, everyone enjoys something different. What I enjoy is different from what you enjoy, from the next person putting it in front of as many people as possible but still having that core idea in your head that's where the real trick is is making sure that you can maintain your vision but make it a playable fun game that's enjoyable so, so. what was your core idea when you started working on King's Watch? Uh, well that's a funny story actually it was mostly because one of my friends hadn't turned up on time to our role playing game so we had the battle mat out and I was like oh Uh, we're still waiting for this person. It's probably going to be another half hour or so. Quick scribble. Uh, oh, walk around a city trying to find criminals. That's literally how it started. It was pen and some D&D &D figures <laughs> on a mat, battle mat, and some post-it notes. Like, believe it or not, post-it notes, yes. Uh, that, was, that was what everything was. It was hastily scribbled. The first game, let's not say it was a disaster, but it, it was entertaining enough for the half-hour time that we were waiting. But after then, it... It was like, oh, this has actually got a seed of an idea. And then I just refined it from there until it got to where it's just at now. Yeah, and I must say that I really like the, the results and uh, I'm anticipating next year. Yes, yeah, as far as I'm aware, it is coming out next year. I haven't got a specific time yet. And the title, while it's the current working title, it might change, as all these things do. There's no right issue with Game of Thrones. No, or... no, we, we did look at Nightwatch at one point. We were like, no, that will get us in a lot of trouble. So the so, King's Watch in King's Landing? I uh, don't think so. My, I'm going to be really badly geeky here and say that my Game of Thrones knowledge is really terrible. <laughs> one thing which is quite interesting today, and again, uh, which is a point of yourself and other people here at Dragon Me, is that you've been playtesting that. So. Yeah, this isn't the only game I've had today. I've, I've been very fortunate and uh, I've managed to have three different games playtested today which is really good the guys at playtest uk are a wonderful bunch and i would recommend anyone who's got especially in the uk um, if you've got an idea for a game and you can get it into a playable state and i don't mean just like little scraps of bit of paper you you should really have like something that people can handle and find, something that you'd be happy to use mm -hmm. not just like something you've written on the back of a post-it note yeah, of course. <laughs> that's fine for friends but not really for something like this you can do but if you bring it to them organize times and meetings with them they'll round up players for you and you get all the feedback you, you so want Playtest UK what, what are they exactly? Uh, they're an organization run in part by Rob Harris he's here today they essentially allow people who have got these ideas who want to be playtesters and experience these new ideas and, and, and just try out stuff because not everyone has access to a large group of friends who are willing to try an untested, unplayed thing that you've just thought up so having a group that is available to meet up regularly 
and we'll go, okay, we turn up and we're here specifically for playtesting. It's not, it's not, oh, we want to turn up and play the new game that's just come out. It's, we're actually here to see these new things in action, to give critical feedback, to say, look, maybe it's a bit too long. Maybe this mechanic doesn't work. Or sometimes it's just like, no, this is a really good game. We really like what you've done with it. Polish up the art and away you go. And those kind of things are very useful for when you're a okay. designer of any kind. I can imagine it. It must be difficult to find people which are not well not your friends and so they, yeah, they have a somewhat I, I'm, objective. I'm a very fortunate person in that I've over the years um, made a, a, a point of trying to expand and have an extended friendship network not like your hardcore best friend buddies but people who you're willing to meet up and if you pull out a prototype made of paper and card and bits of wood they don't just go I don't want to do that I want to do something else they'll go oh that sounds interesting and so I've been very fortunate to do that not everyone can do that so these kind of meetups like at Dragon Me at uh, UK Games Expo and there are all sorts of um, playtest groups all over the world that do similar things I know there's there's some in America and Europe as well but if you're here in the UK Playtest UK is, is the one that is usually the best one to go for because there's lots of people in it and it's pretty central so it's not a problem if the listeners of the Rollies podcast would like to, to find out more about the King's Watch or the other games you're working on where, where they can get the uh, generally if you're looking for King's Watch I'd recommend checking out Wotan Games website W-O-T-A-N Games they are the guys that have taken on King's Watch and I'm putting up a couple of designer blogs got one about the initial start and I'm putting up another one about the changes that have happened also if you want to see some of the stuff that I'm uh, working on myself you can get hold of me on Twitter Ollie Brooks Ollie Brooks yeah uh, I think it's 25 actually I'm pretty sure but yeah uh, it's got all my um, stuff on there so you can I put up posts of uh, pictures and stuff of stuff that I'm working on I don't always get time to update it as much as I should that's a sin I know uh, these days but uh, it gives people an idea of what I'm working on or if there are any convention just stop by any playtest booth or anywhere and say hi and if you see me give me a shout uh, I put all the details in the description of the episode and uh, yeah please do, do check it out and I really recommend to keep an eye on the, the King's Watch or whatever it's going to be called. It's a very promising game. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for talking to me. Have a nice direct with me. Yeah, you enjoy. And you can just about see on the horizon it's the fist of the first men. It's a fort of ancient construction that now lies in ruins at the very top of a huge hill with great natural defences. If there is anything architecturally impressive, I'm really, really impressed because at the moment, it's shit. There is nothing that is marvelling the brilliance of man. There, there is, there is first men stonework. Oh, okay, great. So there is, you know, there's like stonework that you don't see down south. I think it's the journey just to aid straight there and not bother with the tracks. Straight going straight there. Yeah, cool. Yeah, that makes a difference between getting there before night. Before yeah, yes, yeah. I don't okay. stay another night in the tent. You're uh, still going to be sleeping in the tent when we get there. Yeah. Oh, no, there is a stone construction. I yeah, there's a beautiful castle. It's in, it's incredible. And there's this, this, it's this beautiful place. You know, yeah, it's like Winterfell. It's like this incredible yes. castle and you're going to get there soon. And you're going to be in the warmth and it's going to be brilliant. It's going to be... As you clear the haunted forest, you get a clearer picture of this... I'm going to call it a hill, but it is virtually a mountain. It's just a huge thing that goes up. And on the very top, there isn't a castle. But as you get approach closer, you begin to see the slight crest of little walls and little ruined palisades and stuff like that that only appear to just come out the top of the hill. It's not very tall, so there's no towers, That's nothing right. like that. But there are some walls. As the night grows darker... You begin to get closer and closer. Full of terror. And, and full of terror, because <laughs> obviously... How long was that? There we go. <laughs> As it hits nightfall, everyone make an awareness notice check for me. 11. 16. 18. 17. All right. Spank cool. me. All right, fine. <laughs> right, <Wonder>. okay. <laughs> no, these, these are all ace. Okay, right, so... That's not for the ball that stays not for the ball. <laughs> <laughs> As the night gets dark, you all begin to notice a... Oh, I've got a thing written out, actually. I've abandoned all of this. As the dusk light begins to fade into the deep purple moon-drowned night, there lies ahead an impressive sight. Through the thick sentinel trees, the shape of an impressive hill looms over you. It's western ledges jutting... I have way too many podcasts on me. No, no, tell me about it. Yeah, where, where are you? Hey, hi, in there. Come see there. Oh, there you are. Yeah, cool. Hey. 
two episodes. You got more to listen to. I know. Okay, here you go. You are on the podcast now. <laughs> so you're my first. You're the first person I meet randomly. I'm here with... Uh, Andrew Dacey. Andrew, pleased to meet you. Yeah. Callum, you this podcast. You know about me. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm actually listening to your podcast. Yeah. I just interviewed someone who's been playing with you, uh, Porter Williams. He was telling me about Lando in the RPG. So what can you tell me about your group? Basically, we're sort of a loose organization. There's not really any organizing body for the organization, but it's a group of people in London who get together mainly once a month on Saturdays to run story-based narrative games, sort of stuff that's more on the indie scene, and just get together and play games. Usually what happens on, on the main meetup on Saturday is they have a session in the afternoon that starts around 12.30 or so, and that will run till 5, and then they regather together and pitch games then for the evening. It's, it's very loosely organized. People bring games that they want to run. They say who has a game that they want to pitch. They give a quick pitch of what the game is, you know, how many players they need, so a little story of like what, what is the game, what's involved. Then they always do newbies choice, so the people who are brand new, have never played before with Indie Meet, get first choice. Usually then they try to fill that game and make sure that it runs. And then they fill up the other games, and you go off for about four hours and play different story games. And, Cool. And that's, that's, where, where does that take place? Basically, it, it's right around London Bridge is the main area. Where oh, we're located. convenient. Yeah, yeah. So it's really central and easy to get to. They also have a couple midweek ones uh, throughout the month. There's usually a Tuesday night or a Wednesday night one once a month as well, just to kind of get some extra sessions in. And the, the best platform to find you, uh, Facebook, Meetup? Uh, yeah, if you look for London Indie RPG on Facebook or if you look for London Indie Meet on meetup.com are probably the best places to find us. A little question I've been asking everyone today, the, the Rose Podcast trying to uh, make a bridge between uh, cultures. My first question to everyone is, is there a game you find typical of Britons, or which is the most famous, uh, the one you would recommend to French players? See, honestly, I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer that, because where I'm still relatively new to the UK, and most of my role-playing in the UK now has been with Indie Meat, so it's a very small sort of subculture. Particularly within Indie Meat, a lot of, right now, a lot of the games that are powered by the Apocalypse are quite popular. Monster Heart seems to be a perennial sort of favorite. I've heard about this yeah. one. It seems quite yeah. nice. It, yeah, it's a good game. It seems to be quite popular, but any of those games, a lot of the games by Jason Morningstar are quite popular. But really, it's... On Indie Meet, it's often a lot of times where people will bring games that they're playtesting themselves. You get a lot of games that say have kickstarted and they're still in playtest and they're not published yet. So you see a very different set of games than uh -huh. what you might sort of see in the typical uh, UK role play. Anything we should look forward to? Right now, I'd say some of the big ones I'm seeing that are coming out relatively soon. Blades in the Dark seems to be getting really uh, a lot of press and seems to be a really interesting game. There was a brief period of time, and it's, it's just finished kickstarting, but there's a game called Masks, which is uh, teenage superheroes. It can be like Teen Titans. You know, it's teenage superheroes as a superhero team, still trying to figure out their powers, trying to figure out who they are in a superpowered world. As I said, it just finished kickstarting about a month ago, so it's still early playtest, but it seems like a really interesting one that's coming out soon. Cool. The other question I've been asking to people around here is, have you ever heard about any... French game, French tabletop role-playing games. I'm trying to think if there's anything that I've heard. Wasn't um, was Shadows of Estrian? Was that French originally? Yes, yes. yes. That's is, about the yes. only one I can think of off the top of my head that I've really. Uh, heard. I've been lucky enough to interview one of the yeah. creators today. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. it's really nice. Yeah, no, the artwork looks amazing in that. So, yeah. Yeah, well, thank you very yeah, much for yeah, your yeah, time yeah, and no uh, cool. keep on listening. Yeah, nice to meet you. <laughs> Bye. I'm here with Dominic McDowell. You represent or you, you sell Cubicle 7. Ah, uh, that's right. Yeah, I run Cubicle 7. You run? Okay, yeah. <laughs> sorry. <I'm laughs> that's the all right. Most misinformed uh, podcaster ever. <laughs> well, you got a stand here at Dragon Meat with yep. loads of beautiful games. Thank you. My wife, by the way, is a big fan of the One Ring. She keeps looking for game masters to oh, run it in her area. As I said, my podcast is a bit about crossing over the channel. And I was just discussing with Nelly Ann from Shadows of Mesteran. Mm. And we were talking about the, the difficulty of having 
games being translated and the fact that maybe there are good games in Spain that we don't know about, yes. etc. Et and I noticed on your stand, you've got, I'm never sure how to pronounce it, maybe you can help me, Chin Kin? That's right, Chin. Which, yes. which is a French game, I Absolutely. believe. Absolutely. Created yeah. by Nico and Floro. So That's right. Oh, did this game ended up at Cubicle 7. Um, I think a long tangled web of uh, meeting up at conventions and, uh, and things like that. So yeah, no, we get on really well with the uh, the Septim Service team, and uh, yeah, they they uh, they offer us the, the English rights uh, for their for their games, and uh, yeah, fantastic. We, we they love their stuff. They they make such uh, such beautiful games. And, uh, Are you something you especially at the lockout? So games from uh, from other countries that you you would translate? I think. We're, I mean, there's so many good games um, out there in, you know, in all sorts of languages from, from, from everywhere. It's um, an embarrassment of riches, I think, we have at the moment. So, yeah, definitely something that we, we keep an eye on. Uh, we also create all of our own stuff as well, so uh, that's so, a fairly uh, full slate as it is. <laughs> I was mentioning Kim because it's French. Yeah. Over there, are so uh, a special London truc, which yes. seems very interesting. Is it a creation by Cubicle 7? It is, yes. Yeah, that's a deluxe 1920s box set for Call of Cthulhu, covering London um, in all the detail you will ever need, full of gorgeous poster maps yeah, and handouts. Yeah, and that yeah. Two books. yeah, it's it's um, yeah, it's great. <laughs> Very pleased with that one. A question I'm asking everyone here at Dragon Meat is: if you had one British game to recommend to people from outside UK saying, well, this is the most popular or this is the most typical, would you have a British game to recommend? Uh, well, I think you can't get much more British than Doctor Who. Uh-huh. Um, I think that, yes, if you're looking for a British game, then uh, yeah, Doctor Who is definitely one A good seller to, because uh, it's on that table right here. Exactly. I didn't have to look far for it. <laughs> yeah, I think that that's a, um, a fantastic one. And um, one, one of ours that's also being translated into um, to many other languages is Lone Wolf, mm-hmm. which is uh, a Lone Wolf adventure game, which is an introductory set um, to start with, which is you know, done fantastically well. Like a real... Um, proper game that you can use to introduce new people to the hobby and uh, yeah that's so do you have time to all play us. all those games i think i've probably i'm not going to tell you which two i haven't played uh-huh. <laughs> but you know, seven of us now so uh, yeah we, we can cover it all across the team <laughs> beside uh, kin is there any other french game that you might have heard about oh wow uh well shadows of Esteran, obviously uh-huh. um, fantastic uh oh that's put me on the spot isn't it Sure, I can't really think. But there probably are. Well, the the one I keep mentioning to people because I, my impression is that mm. that the one which was exported the most is uh, in Nomine Satanis. Oh, of course, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So by a croc who's quite a, a character of mm. game creator. There's a new version coming out soon. Yeah. I hope maybe it should be <laughs> translated by someone. I don't know. But I can't think of anybody who could do I that. I don't know. I don't know. Something <laughs> squarish. Or maybe, something. maybe. Oh, yeah, seven. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, Nephilim, maybe. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. The shadows of Esther and Sam. They mentioned Maleficent, but then I don't. Oh, yeah. Antidium for a massacre. Haven't so heard of that one. It's about the Huguenot in France, so oh, it's quite right. typical. But at the same time, they fled to London, so yeah, maybe yeah, we should bring it over, shouldn't there. we? <laughs> uh, any any project, new games coming out? I guess you're pushing London Cthulhu right now. That's your. Most uh, we've got one. the um, uh, Lone Wolf Adventure game. That's new. Lots of new stuff coming out for that. Uh, Doctor Who. Um, there's uh, we're doing Doctor by Doctor source books, which go through like the entire history well, of the that's... show. I mean, that's that's fantastic. Are you gonna do John Earth as well? M- Everybody <laughs> keeps asking us that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a Doctor Who fan. I'm just nitpicking. Just. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. No, we'll we'll work him in. The One Ring um, stop for the One Ring is Rohan. Uh-huh. So uh, we'll bring out the Horse Lords oh, oh, to the One nice. Ring. Yeah, that'll be great. And, oh, we're always making great stuff. I think that's the thing about Cubicle Seven. There's always yeah, <laughs> there's always got, something coming out. A tight catalog, but yeah. very very beautiful products. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we got um, Dalek Dice, uh, Pushy Luck Dice game. Um, Basically, it's an excuse to roll dice and shout exterminate <laughs> okay. a lot. Um, and uh, we've got new versions of the Doctor Who card game coming out. Lots, lots. So, and uh, back our Kickstarter. Uh, Cthulhu Tales okay. uh, is running at the moment. You've been locked up in a sanatorium, and you're trying to convince people you're sane so that you'll get let out. Nice. <laughs> nice. Well, not really. But, <laughs> but I know what you mean. <laughs> Sounds great. Sounds great. Well, Absolutely. thank you very much for your time. Thank and, you. Uh, have a very lovely end of day at Dragon Meat. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.
Closing up at Dragon Meat, I'm here with someone you already heard about. Hello, it's James here from so the Roleplay Haven. So, James, um, Dragon Meat is not closed yet, but getting there. Well, they're closing on the shop floor. Some people and the sellers are leaving up because most of the people have been here. But shortly, we're going to be moving all the way up to the pub for the after party. But there's a few games still running also. Yes, there are. Going to be con- uh, we're going to be continuing on. We've got a Game of Thrones game tonight I got yeah, to play. Yeah, that's good. Right, what are you playing, Pospilia? Um, the Cthulhu game in space. Oh, Check you out. Uh, we, we, the Roleplay Haven, are still going to be running some games down here for those who wish to have some in- gaming into the night. But uh, most of the floor sellers will be gone. It's been two, a long day. Two, yeah, 2015, a good year? I think better than 2014. We've been getting a lot of uh, people coming up to us and uh, finding out about us. And uh, hopefully in the future, we'll get some more people turning up at, at our sites. It'll be good. So is it being confirmed that northern branch of the Roleplay Heaven? Yes, we are looking to expand out to the, uh, the, uh, the north. <laughs> we just basically need to get numbers to actually know where to put uh, a site. There's no point basically us putting it in a particular location and no one wants to go there. So that's why we're just basically getting uh, questionnaires, asking people to you know, touch base with us uh, at our sites or email. And then we will get in contact and then uh, ask some questions about where they'll want it when we're actually eventually uh, ready to set up. Cool, cool. And uh, we've got something. February, we've got with the Guild of Rollies Francophone. Yes. And RP Evan and the Rollies Podcast. Yes. The, the first edition there. of Le Drinks and Dice. Yes. Drinks and Dice. That's a good name. Le, oh, dri- no. Le Drinks. Le and, Drinks and Dice. And Dice is. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be monthly, central London. The first should be at Tata Show Castle. Good, good, good. Are you joining us? Which date is it again? Uh, 28th February, I think. Uh, it's going to be every last Monday of the the month. So I be. should be. Um, yeah, I should be. I'll have that Monday. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I can count me in. Tashel Castle would be nice. It's just outside my work. You can be there <laughs> already? Just a bit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like I said, it's just outside my work. That he'll accept you uh, there. Yeah, yeah. One closing word for Dragon Meat 2015. If you're not here, you're missing. We did say she was at the end. <laughs> okay, atop the hill, the, the orange light bounces around, casting shadows of the stone walls and lighting up the broken ring wall that surrounds the hill's crest. The walls are no more than chest height, and they are broken around. As you greet the ring wall, sneaky, sneaky, zooming behind it, glancing over, you see the silhouettes of people at the fire, as well as the faces of those opposite. Opposite, there is a bearded man wrapped in thick pelts and skins, as well as a woman with the same fiery red hair. (laughs) There is the silhouette of someone at the fire, obviously with their back to you. And then comes the builder, <laughs> complaining as loudly as, she, as he did I at the, bo- you, at the bottom of... Up the road when I had installed the whole lever in the most old oh, uh, You hear the unsheathing of weapons at the fire. The man stands, the woman stands, and turning is the silhouette of your brother. The profile of your brother shadowing by the fire and you can just see have the light bouncing off the wall and looking you duck down just before and these guys are alert and the man shouts out roughly who goes your brother oh that happens today someone gag the builder brothers of the night's watch we we come for our brother we have no business with, the, yeah. with anyone else. The woman, I was going to say with the fiery red beard, that didn't work. <laughs> the woman, that works for me. Uh, with the fiery life. red hair, yells across. Well, if we want some business with him, if we want some business with me as well then. Oh, are you together? Well, let, 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 let him speak for himself. Brother asks, who goes? Brother Ryan of the Night's Watch. Oh, yeah, of course. You're, you're, you're absent without leave. It's 
as, as simple as that. Um, I don't know what you've been doing in the meantime, and you can tell us on the way back if you like. But you know what happens. You, you swore an oath to watch. Your, your watch will not end until you die. Uh, cool. Roll me a persuasion. I like the watch until you die, so throw another bonus dice. What's actually mostly occupying me now is that I really don't want your to die. Well, yeah. or any of the rest of us, really. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, nice. cool. uh, go for it. Yeah, I'm going to turn to him and say, look, life is shit down there, but it's even worse up here. And what I know of you is that you wouldn't let your little brother go out and ditch on his own. And at the moment, if we don't turn back with you, he's dead man walking. Nice. And I'm going to be cunning. Nice. Well, what I am going to do, I really like that. I'm going to give you two bonus dice. Okay. So you're rolling four, keeping two. Yeah. So that's 11. All right, cool. Uh, basically, he speaks to Yorin. He says, Brother, my life is out here now. I, I made my choice the day I left. If I go back, they're just going to kill me. I, I can't go back. Uh, Jeremy? Yeah. You're up next, man. Yep. Your apprentice stands in front of you, trying to convince his brothers that his life is beyond the wall now. Yorin, it is not too late. You did not cross the wall back south. You can come back with us. And we'll understand that you were spooked by something which surprised you in the woods. And we were lucky enough to find you and take you back to where you belong. Cool. I really like the idea. The kind of conspiring with the brothers to kind of select. Cool. Well, I'll, I'll give you a bonus dice for that because I, I really like the idea of the kind of conspiracy thing. And I am going to give you a uh, plus two to the actual result. Eight. Cool, all right. Yaren, you were my brother. We came out here together. You're my brother still. We are all here because we are brothers. But if you've chosen to part ways with us, we've got instructions. You're to come back with us, alive or dead. If you choose to take us to battle, you know your brother could be killed. We could all die here. Are they really worth it? Okay. Nice. It's quite intimidating as well. So I am going to give you a bonus dice for that. Nothing else, just because of like the the situation is so tense anyway. Yeah. The intimidation yeah, might not really cool. it might not quite get across as to what we're rolling. Right. So we're rolling two dice, but add that uh, bonus dice in that I threw in there for you as well. So come on, you can do it. You yeah. can do it. I, I'm tempted to just stay stay quiet and, and, and look menacing, but I want to move over so I'm in a different gap, if that makes sense, rather than all in one gap. If you come back with us peacefully, I'll follow what my brothers have said, and your friends can live peacefully as well. Either that, or you all die. Or seven. Boom. <laughs> Alright. Even dead, man. <laughs> So, he lowers his sword. Yeah, you have succeeded. Okay, so, yeah, yeah absolutely, right? Group effort. You succeeded on a Lloyd. Okay. Group effort, so. <laughs> Tag team the young boy. No, wait, the other thing. So he lowers his sword. He looks at all of you, looks at you in particular, Ryan, and says, yeah. uh, fine. He turns to the wildling woman that stands a few metres away from him, looks back to her, sullen expression on his face, and says, I have to go with him. She, though, is not paying attention to him. She is not looking in his direction. She is looking at something beyond. There's a groan and footsteps behind you. Uh, as the wildling man with the fire red beard, axe in his hand, bellows out. The role is podcast. For those who are not familiar with the concept, Patreon allows fans of podcasts of different artists to support them via a subscription of their choice. In the case of the Royce podcast, it starts as low as $1 per month. So, back to the full game session. Since I believe it would be nice to thank patrons, as they are called, I decided to extend a bit the content of the coolies section, the, the bit of the website of the Royce podcast where you got extras. I'm going to expand that section with more material 
full interviews, stuff I recorded and never used in the end, and the full game session of Game of Thrones we recorded in Dragon Meat. So if you want to find out who goes, go see Patreon, go there. You can subscribe for as little as just one month if you want, and for one dollar, and you can have access to that. Sorry, it's a bit of a black mirror, but I'll make it worth it. Besides that, just to be clear, the Rollis podcast remains entirely free and I have no plan to make it, make people pay for it. The Rollis podcast also will remain under Creative Commons license, which means that can be copied and shared as long as it's not done for finance. And that's it, really. Anyway, the best way to support the podcast remains to subscribe and let me know what you think of the podcast. And another way to support the podcast further is to rate the podcast on iTunes or leave a review. Apparently, it makes it with some mysterious algorithm that people get the suggestion to listen to the podcast because iTunes is assuming or calculating that they would be likely enjoying the podcast. So, yeah, so it would be nice to have more people. And by the way, thank you so much to the people who already left a rating. And a very special thank you to those who already left a little review. Valas, thank you so much. Azakoso, thank you so much. It's uh, really nice to also have exchanges with you on Twitter. Two other people I have exchanges with on Twitter. We've got Hippo Will, who's got his own podcast, which I recommend. Ice cream for everyone including, I believe, one where he interviewed someone at Dragon Meat, but I'm not certain because it's not Dragon Meat centric but still very nice, I recommend it. And Dirk the Dice, who is the host of The Grognard Fight, which is really, really nice if you are curious about the, the history of very good classic role-playing game and going really deep into the British culture of role-playing game. And The Grognard Fight also have a special Dragon Meat episode, which is really nice because he will tell you a bit more about the history of that convention and other conventions and his own experience of attending or not conventions. So that was for the UK. In France, also, to people, thank you for your reviews. Monsieur Pierrot, thank you, Monsieur Pierrot. And thank you, Nietzsche. So please, guys and girls, rate the show. So what else? Um, Yeah actually already mentioned it in my discussion in this episode with the people of Roleplay Heaven. On February 29th, we're going to have the first Ludrings and Dices here in London. So Ludrings and Dices is hosted by La Guilde des Rollis Francophones de Londres, Roleplay Heaven, the Phoenix Games Club, and the Rollis Podcast. And the idea is to have every month a friendly social drink event for role players or people curious about tabletop RPG. There's no plan to run games there really because it's much easier to find a space just to meet. But that will be the perfect place if you're a game master to find players or if you are a player to find a table to join. All the details will be in the description but February 29th, Monday at the Tattershall Castle, which is a pub on the Thames, central London, easy to access. I will be there. A few of the people you already heard in previous episodes of the Royal Podcast will be there. People from Rope Heaven, people from La Guilde Rollis Francophone de Londres will be there too. So please, Google it. And I hope you come and enjoy a lovely evening with us to discuss your role-playing adventures and... Uh, ambitions for future campaigns or scenarios. It was the Rollies Podcast episode 7 at Dragon Me 2015. Next episode will be mid-March. And in the meantime, have good games! Uh, as the wildling man with the fire red beard, axe in his hand, bellows out, Who goes? And the f- he knows. <laughs> he's, he's the nameless NPC that says one thing, right? Chill. <laughs>